Hey, good evening, everybody. Give me just a couple minutes to get, uh, get set up here, and we'll get going on our, uh, what would normally be our Sunday morning Bible study. Again, we're doing them Sunday evenings now, starting at 6 p.m. Uh, we're going to continue and actually wrap up and complete our study tonight in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we've been going through this, this quarter using the Gospel Advocates book. So this is our final week in this, uh, in this study on Hebrews. So if you have not already, next time you're at the church building next Sunday, make sure you pick up uh, the book for the next quarter. I thought I was going to have it with me. Uh, I have it around here somewhere. I should have had one where I could have showed you what it looked like. But it's going to be a study of the Apostle Paul in Acts. Uh, so make sure you have that book as we prepare for that study starting next week. This is our last week in the book of Hebrews. So if you have your book, you have your Bible, you're ready to get started, let's look at some things tied to verse 13. Verse 13 of Hebrews is essentially the practical observation, and I believe that's what uh, the Gospel Advocates writer here of this lesson refers to this lesson as, as uh, the practical observations. So this is our, our final week going through the study of Hebrews. I hope you've enjoyed the study uh, as much as I have. I have. I feel like it's been a very beneficial study, uh, certainly a lot of information to take in, to uh, try to take hold of, to, to go deeper into. I know I spent a lot of time really looking at the application side of it, and for good reason, right, that with this overall theme. And if you take nothing away from the study, if, if nothing sticks with you from this study, I hope this does that the theme of the book of Hebrews is a simple one, and that's that Jesus is better. And if you can come away with that idea and with that understanding that regardless of the rest, Jesus is better, and we could go down the whole, the whole gambit of list of things, and I've mentioned them several times throughout this study, of how Jesus is better and to what regards Jesus is better. And that's really been the emphasis so far of this study. I mentioned early on in the very beginning, actually, when we started studying the book of Hebrews, that we don't know who wrote the book of Hebrews. We don't know who the author is. A lot of speculation. A lot of people will say it's the Apostle Paul. Certainly could have been. I've heard everything as far as Apollos, Titus, Timothy. Uh, lots of speculation, right? And while we don't know who wrote the book, we know why it was written. We've learned throughout this study the important question as to why. Why was this book necessary? Why was this book written? What was the purpose of getting this message across? Well, the readers of this book were in real danger of something, of which there would have been no hope for them had they have gone through with, with what they were struggling with potentially. But the reality is they were getting close to drifting away from God, or drifting away from Christ. Drifting away from what they had been taught of Jesus Christ, of the gospel, of his sacrifice, of, of what all he did. And in fact, a couple of verses to make mention of, we wouldn't have time to go all the way back through the chapters and kind of uh, recover some of these things. But just a few to notice, Hebrews 2 verse 1 says, Take heed the things which you heard, why? Lest you drift away. Hebrews 3.12 says, Beware lest there be in any an evil heart of unbelief. Why? End up, or how? End up parting from God. Hebrews 4.11, Be diligent to enter the rest, lest anyone fall according to the same examples of disobedience. Take heed, beware, be diligent. All of these warnings given to these people because they're in real danger here. Really, really are. But... While they are in danger, we can draw encouragement from a certain fact. They hadn't done it yet. They haven't gone to this point yet. Because Hebrews 6, 9 tells us that, that the writer says, we are confident of better things concerning you. That even though that we're speaking about all of these things, we are confident of better things. So the warning is there, the potential is there, the possibility is there, but they haven't done it yet. But the reality is apostasy was just around the corner for them. So the change, and I've mentioned this a couple of times already, the change since chapter 10 has been of this. What does it mean? What is the purpose? 
Why is it here? Well, why do we have this book now? So chapter 10 and following in Hebrews starts the application side of it. It is a, a very important part for us to understand the why. We know what they're dealing with. We don't know the who. We know, we know what they're dealing with, but why? And we looked at the heroes of faith in chapter 11. I talked about that again this morning. We were on that for weeks. Chapter 12, we talked about the race of endurance and the fact that it's something you have to keep striving for and you have to keep pushing for. If you remember last week, one of the uh, talking points from this study was on this moment of decision. And I mentioned to you that my company uses this phrase a lot, been around my company since I've been with them now for over a decade. And they use this phrase a lot, moment of decision. It's a choice. So ultimately, that's what the readers of the, the book of Hebrews have before them now is a choice. Which are you going to choose? It's your moment of decision, uh, readers of this letter. Who are you going to choose? Here is all of the ways Jesus is better. It's not about Moses. It's not about Levites. It's not about high priest. Here's how Jesus is better. But at the end of the day, when it's all said and done, it comes back to your choice and your choice only. Same thing for us. Why is it here for us? Because it's the same question for us. Who do you choose? What are you going to choose? What choice are you going to make? So now in this closing chapter, in this chapter 13, the author is going to continue in these practical observations, specifically for the Christian life. So that's what we're going to focus on today with our remaining time. I want to recover just a, a few verses to kind of set our mind uh, on where it needs to be for the study. But we're going to continue on and what it means. That, that's our focus for this final chapter. Before we get going with our text here in just a moment, uh, pray with me if you will. Our holy God and Father in heaven, hallowed be thy merciful and thy blessed name. Our holy God, I'm so thankful for you for this day, this, this beautiful day, this absolutely gorgeous day that you have given us. And more importantly, the opportunity that you have given us on the first day of the week to assemble together, to worship your glorious name, to take the emblems of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made on, on the cross, to sing, hymn, to sing hymns to you, to offer up prayers and worship. Father, I'm grateful for this day and the blessings that you've given us. I'm grateful now for the opportunity that we have to open your word and continue studying, to go through this Bible study with fellow Christians, with fellow saints, to look at the message you have before us. And I pray that we keep our focus on that question. What does it mean to us? Why is it here for us? How can we learn from it? How can we grow from it as we look at these observations? Father, be with us throughout this study. I ask that you help guide our hearts and our minds as we read your word, that we read the message that is before us and not impose our own thought and our own mindset to it. Forgive us of our many unforgiven sins, Father, and please be with us, guide us always. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So if you have your Bible and you've made it over to Hebrews chapter 13, or if you're using the book, either one, uh, I typically just read from the Bible, we're going to do, it's a split section. We're going to look at the first 13 verses of Hebrews 13, 1 through 13. Then we're going to look at the last five verses. We're going to, we're going to skip a little bit there in the middle, uh, but we're going to jump 1 through 13 and then 20 through 25. So if you have your Bible, read along with me. Verse 13 starts off by saying, let brotherly love continue. Do not, uh, do not forget to entertain strangers, for by so doing, some have unwittingly entertained angels. Remember the prisoners as if chained with them, those who are mistreated since you yourselves are in the body also. Marriage is honorable among all and the bed undefiled. But fornicators and adulterers, God will judge. Let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So we may boldly say, the Lord is my helper. I will not fear. What can man do to me? Remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. 
Do not be carried about with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace, not with foods which have not profited those who have been occupied with them. We have an altar from those who serve the tabernacle, have no right to eat. For the bodies of those animals whose blood is brought into the sanctuary by the high priest for sin are burned outside the camp. Therefore, Jesus also, that he might sanctify the people with his own blood, suffered outside the gate. Therefore, let us go forth to him outside the camp, bearing his reproach. Now jump down to verse 20. Verse 20 reads, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight. Through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear the word with exhortation, for I have written to you in few words. Know that our brother Timothy has been set free with whom I shall see if he comes shortly. Greet all those who rule over you, and all the saints, those from Italy, greet you. Grace be with you all. Amen. Grace be with you all. Amen. So that, that is our final text in the book of Hebrews. So as we do so with the Gospel Advocates book, and I really think it, it lends itself to good conversation, especially when we get back to the point of being able to go through this together and in person, I enjoy the way the questions are laid out and you can kind of build and grow off of them. So as we get to them, make sure you have your questions pulled up. Uh, the way the screen is set up now versus how it would normally be if I was at the church, you would see the questions kind of over here behind me. That's not the case now as I'm at my house. Uh, so I will call the questions out as we go through them. And of course, if you have the book, you'll be able to follow along as well. So let's notice the verse, the first verse of chapter 13 again with this question. What should Christians seek to continue? So this is the practical observation. This is the final exhortation to the Hebrew uh, readers here. So what's the final exhortation to them in the very beginning? How are you going to start it? Well, what's our first question? What should Christians seek to continue? Well, notice what verse 1 says. Simple little verse. Let brotherly love continue. It's amazing how the shortest verses are often the most impactful in this great book. It really is incredible. It's a, it's a simple statement. Let brotherly love continue. Now, the Hebrews author is going to make a few different exhortations really throughout this chapter. There's a few different ones um, Ruth, for, for example, I know she likes to take notes. If you're somebody that likes to take notes on this, you can really break this down into three categories as far as exhortations go. First off, the exhortation of social interactions. How are you interacting with others? Your duties in regards to social interactions. The next are your religious duties. And then finally, just some general instructions. So if you're going to break all of that down, with all of that in mind, looking at the three different categories, where do you start this final chapter? What's the important message on the last chapter of this book to start with? Let brotherly love continue. So when you hear this phrase, let brotherly love continue, Likely your mindset went to that of the majority of people. Brotherly love, where do I know that phrase from? The ah, Philadelphia. That's where that word comes from. Philadelphia, city of brotherly love. And that's the idea behind the name of that city. It's the city of brotherly love. And you'll also often see the little asterisk there, or the, the sisterly affection. The love of a sibling for one another. Brotherly love, sisterly affection. So put that into focus then for us as Christians with this question in mind. Who's your brother? Not a complicated question, is it? Who's your brother? Who's your sister? Do you love fellow Christians? Do you love one another outside of your blood in the same manner to which you love your own brother and sister? What would you be willing to do for them? Now, anytime you think about brotherly love and you think about 
this verse, 13 verse 1, let brotherly love continue, it would be very easy to read the account of the Good Samaritan. That's kind of where your mind instantly goes to, right? Who, who was the one taking care of their brother? Well, it was, it was the Good Samaritan. It was the person that was thought least of. It was the person that was the least regarded. It, he's the one that did it. But notice something that Jesus said. I didn't want to spend much time on the Good Samaritan because we do talk about that one you know, a pretty good bit, and for good reason. It, it lends itself very nicely to this argument. But I want you to notice what Jesus said in Matthew verse 25. Uh, Matthew chapter 25, excuse me, verse 37 through 40. I knew something didn't sound right. Matthew 25, 37 through 40. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when do we see you hungry and feed you, thirsty and give you drink? When do we see you a stranger and take you in or naked and clothe you? When do we see you sick or in prison and come to you? And the king will answer surely to them, Assuredly, I say to you, and as much as you did it to one of the least of these, my brethren, you did it to me. Let brotherly love continue. Uh, Kaufman, who's my commentary of, of choice, I, I look at several different ones when I'm studying, and I like to read the Bible, look at some commentaries, go back to the Bible. I kind of have a little pattern set up, but Kaufman is normally one of the first ones I'm going to pull to. And I love his a phrase he makes on this. It says, every man is my brother. If I miss him in Christ, I will hit him in Adam. And I love the way he phrases this. Every man is my brother in Christ or in Adam. So if you're going to start this, this chapter off, this final thoughts chapter, where are you going to start? Let brotherly love continue. The recipients of this letter have clearly been doing well to this point. At least it, it certainly seems that way, that this is an area they've been doing okay. But you can see the urgency, right? It's, it's easy and potential for them to fall away from Christ, just as the potential is there for them to fall away from their calling as a brother or a sister in Christ. So put this in focus for the church today. And I, I, I like to keep coming back to this application. What does it mean to us? Because we don't get much from it if we don't ask that question. Well, what does it mean to me, for me, all of these things? Why is it here for me? So let's put this in the focus of the church today. And, and uh, I'm trying to be careful to not start preaching. Most everybody on here has already heard me preach a good bit today. So I don't want to start preaching, but I don't want you to miss this point. Let brotherly love continue is where he starts. A letter written to saints, a letter written to a church. Let brotherly love continue. So if you're a church that truly loves one another and a church that truly desires to edify and build up one another, to encourage one another, can anything stop the momentum of that church? The gospel will be on fire coming out of that church. That's the love and the encouragement they have in themselves. A political agenda is not going to stop it. Some coronavirus is not going to stop it. Nothing is going to stop a church like that. A church that focuses on that mindset. But look at the other side. Look at the warning to these people here. And look at the other side to us as well. What about a church filled with hate? Or, or just not love in general. Hate may be a little strong. But filled with something opposite of love if you want to call that a church, are they doing good works for the kingdom? You might can make an argument that something they've done might be a good work, but are they, is the reality that, that they are causing more damage than good by just in the way they carry themselves and not being a love-filled church and spreading hate, not love? Now, I will tell you, most of you know this, my, part of my history, I've been a part of both churches. I've been a part of a church that was not filled with love, a, a couple of them that was just not filled with love. People didn't want to talk with each other, didn't want to interact with each other. It was not pleasant. It was not uh, uplifting and edifying. You know, And you read the Bible. We all read the Bible, but you didn't come away encouraged. In fact, desire of service has all but left in that moment. It's not something that you should feel when leaving a church. Now, it's not to say that you go to church just to be 
puffed up every single day, but you should leave encouraged. Because regardless of where you've been, the news is good. Jesus won. And if we're in Jesus, we win. It's good news. So you should always leave encouraged. Go encourage someone else. So he starts off with one of the best places to start of encouragement for anyone in practical observations. Let brotherly love continue. I think it must mean that it's important since he starts with it, right? It's kind of how it reads. All right, I don't want to start preaching, so I'm going to keep going. So jump down to verse 4 now of Hebrews 13. Verse 4. Let's look at what the author of this book says is honorable. What did the author of Hebrews say is honorable? Well, verse 4 tells us, Marriage is honorable among all, and the bed undefiled. Did you know that marriage is the oldest union in the Bible? You've, you've probably heard that before. I'm not telling you anything you likely didn't know. That marriage is the oldest union in the Bible. So, well, the church is pretty old. Well, you go back to the garden. Who was there? Adam and Eve, man and wife, together. So what then is the focus on marriage? It's kind of odd to just throw that in there, right? But what is the focus here? Well, the writer says that, the, that marriage is honorable amongst all. So then when I read this, and I'll just kind of tell you where my mind went with it, and maybe yours did as well, maybe not. But when I first read this, my mind went to context on verses where people will say, well, no, the Apostle Paul said that you need to live a celibate life. It's superior state, so it's not really that honorable to be married. It's, you should be, be celibate. That's really where the honor comes. And then you can look at like the, the papal system now that, you know, that's incur, actually that, that, that's promoted and required if you're going to be part of this papal system as the, the Pope and all of that kind of things where the, the celibacy side and the purity side, because that's really the, the higher state of mind to be like that. That's, that's really more honorable. I mean, marriage is okay, but, but that's, it's not really the case. And then that's, when I think about that, it's more ironic to me to see that and then realizing the same ones pushing that are also the same ones that say, well, Peter was the first pope, even though Peter was married. And now the Hebrews writer here says marriage is honorable. So that, that was a, a little aside there. My mind kind of went there when I first read this verse. And we could go into debates on that. We could go into discussion on that. And, and you actually see how it's all very complimentary of one another. There's no contradiction there. But what is the important part here? What's the focus here? It's not to get into a celibacy, a celibacy versus marriage debate. There's a warning here. That's the important part. Fornicators and adulterous people will be judged by God. That it's the marriage where these things are honorable to be and do. Because there's a place for all of these kinds of things. Yes, and including, kids, you can cover your ears. Yes, and including sexual relations. There is a place and a purpose for those things. Guess what? It's in the marriage unit. Two individual people becoming one body in God. Now, I have come to appreciate, and I won't spend a lot of time on this. I've come to appreciate you know, the hand thing where you, you put your fingers together. Y'all probably have seen that before. But I really like that illustration. And it, it's a little playful thing but you know the emphasis there is on you can't separate those ring fingers once you do that and it's you know science uh, we could go into why you can't but the point there is to show that you can't separate those two those two people become one and, and they don't come apart anymore now i understand what you're going to say well our society says that's perfectly normal and you're right but our society goes against what God established. That's what our society has turned marriage into. The Hebrews writer here, as is the biblical example, says that marriage is honorable. What, what God joins, no man can separate. And, and this is not a, a divorce discussion on uh, adultery and that kind of thing. That, that's for a different conversation. 
But he emphasizes this point here that marriage is honorable, but really it's the warning because of the culture that they're in. Listen, listen, adulterers, fornicators, God's going to judge you on these things. Now, we're all going to face judgment. But he he lands that point. It almost, when you read it, you're almost like, well, that just kind of got thrown out of left field. Well, no, it's a stern warning to them. So jump down one more verse. Go down to verse five now. Let's look at the next question. What should be absent from our conduct? Well, then you read verse five. It says, let your conduct be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have, for he himself has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will never leave you nor forsake you. So what should be absent from our conduct? What, what should be missing? What, what should not be included in the mindset of the attitude of the behavior of all of these things of the Christian mindset? Covetousness. Why do you imagine it's so hard for people to be satisfied with what they have? Isn't that, isn't that kind of crazy? Do you ever really just think about that? Why that is such a challenge? Other translations are, are talking specifically about money. And, and your translation may even say that. It, uh, Let your conduct be without covetous. Be content with such things as you have. It is, it's really directly tied to money. Be free from the love of money. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells Timothy, um, and in turn, of course, us. Always remember it's us as well. In 1 Timothy 6.10, that money is what? The root of all evil. And I find that interesting. I really do. I find that phrase very interesting, as well as this verse right here of covetousness. Because I've held a dollar. I don't get to hold a dollar long because my wife then takes that dollar. But I've held a dollar before. Nothing seems inherently evil about that dollar. So is it money that's evil or the desire of money that's evil? And we know that answer. It's not money itself. It's the desire for more money. So watch the news, read a paper, do all this. When you click on headlines, what are you going to see a lot of times kind of right there at the very top? You're going to see a lot of times someone in handcuffs somewhere around the main headlines. They're going to jail for a specific purpose. They wanted more of what they had a little of, so they took it. They stole it, they robbed it. It could be a robbery on Main Street, Main Street or a scheme on Wall Street. They wanted more and they took it. But do you see the warning to the people here, to, to all these people about these things? If you are coveting these things, you are not relying on God. Your faith is not where it should be on God. Your faith isn't where it should be as a Christian, because again, letter written to saints here, because it should be 100% entwined with God. And what has God said? What does it? this verse right here kind of wrap up with? And you read it, and it's almost like, well, he just kind of threw that in there. It really doesn't even make sense. But he adds the passage in here from Psalm 118, it says, he will never leave us nor forsake us. But that's not good enough. I want to go about and go do it on my own. I want to get more. Look at, look at what Bob next door's got. I, I want a boat like that. I want, well, how does he have that? I, I want a car like that. Now, before I get any comment, negative comments here, there's nothing wrong whatsoever with earning a living, supporting, and providing for your family. Using the gifts that God has given you, it is a blessing from him. There's absolutely nothing wrong with that, nor would I say there is something wrong with that. But if your emphasis is on yourself, and your emphasis is on your possessions, and your focus is to grow what you have, it's a quick fall to the bottom. Because now your priorities are off. You're focused on things here, things now, things you can touch, things you can feel. And where are our treasures to be laid up? Not here. But the reality for some is the bottom is where we need to be. You say, well, that's almost kind of hurtful. I don't want to be at the bottom. Well, sometimes you have to hit the bottom to be able to refocus and reset and get going in the right direction once again. So the Hebrews writer is going to throw in this quote here of Psalm 118, verse 6. 
the Lord is my helper, the, I will not fear. So think about that phrase, the Lord is my helper. The Lord is my provider. The Lord is my nurturer. And we could just keep going on of all the different phrases that we could put in there. But that's the emphasis, right? It's about Jesus. Stop thinking about it from your mindset. Think about it from Jesus' stance. That's who it's about. Jesus is better than all of these other things. The, the fornicators, the adulterers, the covetous, all these things, God's going to judge them. You focus on Jesus. The Lord is my helper. Focus on that. All right, let's jump down a couple more verses. I want to try to keep moving. Let's jump down to verse 7 now. Hebrews 13, verse 7. How should Christians treat those who rule over them? Well, you read verse 7 now. It says, remember those who rule over you, who have spoken the word of God to you, whose faith follow, considering the outcome of their conduct. There is nothing more moving or nothing that leaves a, a longer lasting impact on someone than a faithful example. And that's the reality. They are the ones that we want to imitate. They are the ones that we want to be like and follow after because they followed after Christ. The Apostle Paul says that, imitate me, follow me as I follow Christ. Well, we look at examples like this. Now, of course, our goal is to imitate Christ. But we look to these faithful examples. These were faithful Christians that had taught them the word of God, this passage tells us, who have spoken the word of God to you. This could be elders, preachers, teachers. Someone that was willing to guide you, maybe a, a better literal translation, a guide. Some of your translations may even have that in the side, have God written out there. Now, I don't want you to confuse verse 7 with verse 17. Uh, verse 17, the, the letter verse, is in regard to those leading and teaching you today. That's not the case here in verse 7. Notice the phrase used, considering the outcome of their conduct. These examples used here in verse 7 have died. But not only that, and much more importantly than that, they were faithful examples that died. They died faithfully. So the encouragement to them is remember them. Remember those examples. Remember those teachers. Remember the things that they did and how they lived their life. Not, not in the everyday thing because they weren't perfect. We know they couldn't have been perfect because there was only one perfect but remember how they live faithfully. That's the importance of the example that they have before them. And nothing sticks with you better than a faithful example that you witnessed and you were mentored under and you saw how they lived their life. That sticks with you. So if you have someone like that, remember them. Remember those who taught you. Then if you don't have one, here's a little, little aside here for you, maybe a little bit of encouragement. If you don't have one, if you don't have an example like that of somebody in your life, be an example of that to somebody. Because not everybody has an example of that. So if you don't have one, be one. Because we need them. So let's jump down one more verse. Verse 8, before I start preaching again. So how is Jesus described in verse 8? Next question, question number five. How is Jesus described in Hebrews 13, verse eight? Again, not an overly long verse, not an overly complicated verse, but a weighted verse. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So how is Jesus described? Well, Jesus is constant. Jesus is unchanging. And in fact, I've seen many uh, describe Jesus this way as the unchanging one, which is such a blessing uh, because we change like the weather, unfortunately. That's, that's, that's how we are. That's the reality. We change like the weather changes. So why mention this verse here? It's kind of important to keep with why is this placed here and why is this where it is? Uh, the point here is to encourage the readers Help them see who it is they're following. 
Remember that Jesus was more than able to perform all of those miracles way back when. Remember that Jesus uh, persevered in all the trials that he faced, and even death couldn't keep him. He persevered. He persevered for the generations before. And he will persevere for you as well. Yes, you're facing trials and tribulations. I understand that. But Jesus will persevere. And he will be with you. Because remember the other side of the warning that they've already gotten. Jesus has already warned them. Uh, the writer has already warned them about this. If you give up Jesus, if you turn away from Jesus, you're giving up the only hope that you have. What hope is there without the Lord? The same one that's constant, the same one that's changing, uh, unchanging. Without that, without that constant, what hope is there? What, what hope or plan of salvation is there? Give me one second. I gotta, I gotta close these blinds. Oh, I'm sorry about that. That glare was about to drive me absolutely crazy. Oh, that's better. So Jesus is the unchanging one. And I've seen that uh, terminology used to describe Jesus several times. I, I like that terminology. But understand what else that means. Yeah, you, could, you can kind of stop with that and say, okay, well, Jesus is the unchanging one. Okay, I get it. But I want you to understand what else that means. Because it doesn't stop there. That means... His system of faith is unchanging. And by system of faith, I'm talking about the system of faith, the gospel system of faith, which may not make a whole lot of sense to you since you see churches changing every single day. And you can just go down the street and pick your, your flavor of ice cream type church. Well, I don't, want, I don't want vanilla today. I want strawberry or chocolate. I want, I want a different flavor today. Because churches are always changing. But that's odd because the gospel is unchanging. The plan of redemption is unchanging. Even though man tried, plan of redemption is unchanging. The system of faith is unchanging. And the author of the faith is unchanging. But here's some good news. All of that I would say is good news. But here's some more good news. The glory of our Lord is unchanging. The promises that he has made is unchanging. So why would you want to give up something like this? Why would you want to cast aside something like this, especially as is the case here for these Hebrews readers that are considering going back to Judaism or fighting with false doctrine? And This is what you're willing to give up and turn from. Why would you? Jesus is the, is the same. He's unchanging. He'll persevere for you just as he did for the previous generations. His promises are the same. His gospel is the same. It's all the same. He's unchanging. So why would you cast that away for something that can't help you? So that's the encouragement there to him on that. Go down one more verse now to verse 9. So if Jesus is unchanging, so then what must we guard ourselves against? If we are in Christ, what must we guard ourselves against? Well, verse 9 says, Do not be carried away with various and strange doctrines. For it is good that the heart be established by grace. So what must we guard against? Well, strange and various doctrines. And I know I mentioned this a second ago, but how many... Uh, new opinions and new ideas come into churches every single day. And, and I mean, I've heard stories of one-time faithful churches uttering phrases like, well, I know what the Bible says, but... Well, yeah, I mean, okay, we know what it says, but, but we're going to study it some more. Well, no, you're trying to get around it. You can just stop with, I know what the Bible says, and stop, done, Period. But all these new ideas and these new thoughts and these new ways of going about things keep coming into the church. And for what purpose? To spread the gospel or to change the gospel? To make it more appeasing and uh, appealing to people and, and water it down and, and weaken it to the point of it's, it's of no effect. 
And, and these people are getting hit on both sides. I mean, they really are. That was the, the church in that day, in the first century, was getting hit on both sides. You read through the book of Revelation and you just look at what the seven churches of Asia went through. I, I'm thankful I'm in the time and age I am now in the church. Because on one side, you're having to deal with Judaizers, okay? You're having to deal with laws. You're having to deal with feasts. You're having to deal with all kinds of acts you're supposed to go through. You're having to do all of these things. And in fact, we see here in this verse, verse 9, the talk of foods that haven't profited them going with, with food in reference. <clears throat> well, that's going back to Judaism, going back to sacrifices that would be offered. Then on the other side, when you look at other churches in that day and age, well, they were getting bombarded on the other side with Gnosticism and, and false doctrine and false teaching where the idea that anything physical is evil, only spiritual can then be holy. So Jesus couldn't be holy because he was in the flesh. And so you have both of these things just pounding on these churches. But then we can very easily blend back to the author's point. Your heart is established in grace, established by grace. Okay, so let's go with grace. Grace is a gift of God. Well, it's a gift, but it had a price. What price was it? Well, the blood of Christ. Not some animal sacrifice or some food to be burnt outside the gate, but the blood of Christ. So you go all the way from God's grace and you step it down to the point that you get to, well, what purchased the right of that grace upon us? How do we, how do we uh, come into contact with God's grace? How do we accept the gift of God's grace? Well, it's in the blood of Christ. So then I love the use of the next verse. We're not going to really look at the next couple of verses. But I like the use of the next verse in verse 10. Notice what verse 10 says. We have an altar from which those who serve the tabernacle have no right to eat. So you're worried about sacrifices and you're worried about the sprinkling of blood and you're worried about the foods and the meat and so on. But understand, the priests couldn't eat of these foods. They were burned outside the camp. You didn't eat of those foods. You didn't get grace bestowed upon you by eating of those foods. Our true sin offering, so the comparison, but we're always coming back to this comparison because that's the point. It's a practical observation section. So the point here is our true sin offering is Christ, nothing else. Stop trying to substitute it. If you want to adhere to the old law, then understand you don't have a place at the table. And verse 12 makes it abundantly clear. Jesus is the one that sanctifies his people through his own blood. Is it confusing? It makes it pretty clear. So now I'll jump all the way down to verse 20. We're going to look at a couple of descriptions quickly uh, of both God and Christ. Verse 7 says, How does the author of Hebrew, uh, question 7, says, how did the author of Hebrews describe God and Jesus in verse 20? Well, verse 20 says, Now may the God of peace, who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of his everlasting covenant. So we have the God of peace and the great shepherd. So first off, the God of peace. He's not only the God of peace, but you've got to understand the importance that he's the source of peace. And it was quite common for the Apostle Paul. So this is where a lot of people will kind of jump on this as uh, part confirmation for the Apostle Paul. And it, it could very well be. But he would use this terminology very free, uh, very regularly, right? It, it wasn't uncommon to see the God of peace in his writings. And then we see that word peace. Well, peace in the New Testament was used to denote all the blessings that we have of which flow through Christ, Right? The blessings of comfort and of reward and of healing and all of these things. Well, then it opposes the opposite idea of trouble and unrest and disturbance found outside of the peace of God. So here it is that we have God's peace. Well, the verse tells us 
that Jesus Christ was, was, he was sacrificed on the cross of Calvary. That's how his peace was manifested to mankind. And God raised him from the dead. So then you get to Jesus. How is Jesus described here? Well, Jesus is described as the shepherd of the sheep. John 10, verse 14 and 15, Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my sheep and am, and am known by my own. As a father knows me, even so I know the father and I lay down my life for the sheep. So if you're going to talk about Jesus as the shepherd, just, just quickly think about a couple of things. What is the purpose of a shepherd? What was their, their primary responsibility? Well, they both protected and guided the sheep. That was their purpose. They would stay with the sheep. They would ward off attacks from the evil, you know, animals coming to eat the sheep and all that kind of thing. But what if the sheep strayed away from the shepherd? Could they still be protected? But a good shepherd is going to go find that sheep. And in fact, Jesus tells us, who's not going to leave the 99 and go find the one? So put this again into context for the Hebrews. You're facing persecution. You're facing trials. You're facing all sorts of issues, okay? And it's easy to, to give up and just go along with what other people are wanting to do. And, and you're just you're kind of getting beat down and demoralized. But in these last few verses, this is the last big push. And in fact, the next one we're going to look at, you see phrases like, and I appeal to you. I'm encouraging you. So in these last couple of verses, this is the final push of the Hebrews writer to encourage them to, listen, stay the course. Keep going. Here's, here's God of peace, this God of blessing upon you. Here's the shepherd who laid down his own life to protect his sheep. This is who we are following. Remember Jesus. Jesus is better. So then lastly, the, the final question comes from verse 22. What did the author encourage his audience to do with the message? Notice what verse 22 says. And I appeal to you, brethren, bear with the word exhortation, for I have written to you in a few words. Bear it with exhortation, the writer says. And this is where, again, you'll hear people attributing this letter to the Apostle Paul because uh, the way I've heard it described in the past was Hebrews is kind of a continuation of Romans. You know, Romans 12, and you just continue on and you're in the book of Hebrews. But Paul says in Romans 12, verse 1, I urge you, brethren, to present yourself. I, I encourage you. And it's a lot of very similar terminology used here. But we find this appeal. And other translations, translations will say, and I exhort you. So what is this final encouragement? The, the final thoughts here on Hebrews 13. If you've got any comments on this study in general or tied to the verse, uh, chapter 13, make sure you get them on here. But just a couple of final thoughts because they're good encouragement to us as well as Christians today. What, what is the final push? What is the final encouraging message to the, church, uh, to the saints here uh, that are receiving this letter from the Hebrews writer? Persevere. Run the race with endurance. Christ is unchanging. And Christ will see you to the end. Christ is going to make intercession on your behalf. Keep pushing. Bear the word. It's not a long letter by any stretch, but it's a powerful one. Because this letter, the Hebrews letter, just exalts Christ. And, and for good measure, it's, it's all about Christ. Christ is better. Christ is the way. Christ is the hope. And then we get to our point. And like I said, if you take nothing away from the study in general other than this, if you ever go back to studying the book of Hebrews, and I hope you do, remember this. Easy thing to remember. Jesus is better. Jesus is our high priest. Jesus is our intercessor, not some Levite that was a sinful man that needed a sacrifice for himself. This is Jesus. Jesus is better. So that's his encouragement. That's the writer's encouragement to the recipients of this letter. Remember Jesus. Because without Jesus and the reality for them, as much so as the reality for us, without Jesus, what hope is there? 
Who can save you apart from Jesus? So if you reject Jesus, what hope then do you have? Because there is nothing that can save you. And that was their encouragement to run the race of endurance. So I hope you've enjoyed the study in the book of Hebrews. I certainly have. I, I've taken away a lot from it. Uh, I hope you have as well. Uh, if you have any thoughts, any questions, any comments, make sure you get them on there. I'd like to see what you think in general. Uh, if you'd like to study more in depth, reach out to me and I'd be more than happy to do so with you. As I said, starting next Sunday, Lord willing, we are going to study the Apostle Paul in Acts. We spent the last quarter looking at Peter in Acts. Um, starting next Sunday, we'll be looking at the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts. So make sure you get your workbooks next time you're at the church if you don't have them already. Uh, if there's no other questions, if you don't have any thoughts or comments, uh, I'm going to go ahead and wish you all a good night. I hope you have a good week. Uh, I think the weather is supposed to be very pleasant. Uh, I would encourage you to, to go out and encourage someone this week. Lift someone up this week. It, there's a lot of negativity going on right now. Just go, go lift someone up this week. Be an encouragement to someone this week. And Lord willing, I hope to see you all again uh, Sunday in person. Again, we'll uh, have our Daniel study on Tuesday night. Um, we're in chapter 10 this week. We'll be picking up in Ephesians on Wednesday night and then back at the building on Sunday. Hope you all have a good week. Thank you for your time and your attention tonight. God bless you all.